In the 1800s, the Reverend Sidney Smith described in some of his uh, writings uh, the feeling of gout, and I think this is a very appropriate uh, way to look at this disease from the patient's standpoint. First, let's talk about what gout is. Gout is an intense inflammatory arthritic disease. It occurs in episodic uh, fashion. That is, patients will report an acute onset of uh, pain, swelling, and extreme tenderness. It is usually a monoarthritis, though with time patients can develop a polyarticular gouty arthritis. It occurs episodically. Uh, it, the episodes are um, separated by a quiet period or an intracritical period during which there is minimal to no symptoms. Uh, it is by far the most common inflammatory arthritis. Recent studies have, uh, population studies have shown that over 8 million Americans suffer from gout. It is predominantly in men, but we are starting to see it increasingly in women. In general, we are seeing it with an increasingly frequent occurrence. Uh, ten years ago, the estimated incidence was about six and a half million. There are a few things it's important to realize uh, about what gout is not. First of all, gout is not a uh, an a elevated uric acid. Not everybody with an elevated uric acid is going to develop gout. Similarly, uh, it is not the cause of all foot pain. Um, I've seen many patients who have presented with a little soreness in their foot and have been told it must be gout simply because it's in the foot. Third, it is not something that is triggered by um, a glass of wine on an occasion. Finally, uh, it is a lifelong chronic disease. It is not a disease that can be treated with just an occasional uh, short course of non medication and a few uh, weeks of allopurinol. When one tries to look at uh, the patients that are more likely to develop gout, uh, there are a variety of risk factors that have been identified. First, we do know that it, uh, its incidence increases as the patients get older. As I said earlier, it is also a disease uh, predominantly of men, uh, although we are seeing it increasingly in women. Generally, females who have it are postmenopausal. It is extremely unusual to see it in a premenopausal female. There are a variety of comorbidities that have been identified. First, hypertension is a very common uh, comorbidity. Similarly, um, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. This is somewhat interesting because uh, we are now starting to see that hyperuricemia may be playing a more active role in diseases such as uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Uh, finally, lip dyslipidemia is another uh, common comorbidity. There are a number of medications that can actually trigger uh, uh, or increase the risk of gout as well. Thiazide diuretics and low-dose salicylates are two of the more common. Um, levodopa, nicotinic acid, and cyclosporin are um, other medicines that have been shown to increase the serum uric acid. Finally, lifestyle issues. Um, we know that certain uh, foodstuffs such as high fructose corn syrup, such as it is found in most soft drinks in the United States, uh, heavy alcohol intake, particularly beer, is uh, one that's known to increase uh, serum uric acid levels. Also, a uh, diet that is rich in organ meats and uh, shellfish. And finally, patients who are obese have an increase in their serum uric acid. In order to better understand uh, this disease, I think it's important to look at the natural history of hyperuricemia and gout. By far the most common grouping is that of patients in asymptomatic hyperuricemia. Uh, this is a required precursor to attacks. Without hyperuricemia, you essentially cannot have classic uh, gout. Um, the vast majority of patients are in this category. Uh, about six out of seven patients with hyperuricemia will never ever have an attack. Uh, this is the kind of patient who comes in and has what they used to call an executive panel and is found to have a uric acid of 7.8 or 8.5 or whatever. These patients have no history of attacks. They don't have any physical findings, clinical manifestations. 
once the first attack occurs, this is when um, we start to see problems. Uh, it is an acute inflammation, usually a sudden onset, and this is uh, generated by the phagocytosis of monosodium urate crystals. These patients uh, will report that it is an extremely painful attack, and uh, they uh, often use the term, the sheet hurts to touch. Subsequently, the patients enter into intercritical periods. The monosodium urate crystals are still within the tissues, and during this time, more crystals can be deposited. While the patient's not seeing a lot of pain, there is some level of chronic inflammation and tissue destruction going on. There is uh, active inflammation in the uh, space, and it's important to realize that just because they're not having an acute attack doesn't mean they're not having gout. And finally, there are the patients who will have a chronic advanced inflammatory disease, and this is where they have a polyarthropathy, they will have persistent inflammation, and the pain just continues on and on and on. As I mentioned previously, uh, patients must have hyperuricemia to develop gout. Um, normally, uh, a patient is uh, at hyperuricemia when the number when their serum uric acid levels are above 6.8. At this time, the uh, serum has, or the serum solubility has reached a supersaturated uh, place, and we will start to see monosodium urate crystals developing and being deposited in the tissues. It should be noted that uh, maximum solubility is 6.8 at normal body, core body temperature. If you start to drop the temperature, such as one sees in uh, colder parts of the body, such as the feet, uh, elbows, uh, ears, uh, external ears, and so forth, then the solubility will drop to about 6.0. Uh, monosodium urate crystals are then in, they're microscopic. They're about the size of a bacteria. They're engulfed by inflammatory cells. They get coated with inflammatory mediators, and this is what triggers an inflammatory response. With time, we start to see large collections of the crystals. Uh, these are the classically described TOFI, and also we will start to see uh, the development of a chronic inflammatory arthritis. This slide shows a few of the causes of hyperuricemia. Uh, it should be noted that the vast majority of patients with hyperuricemia are having it due to underexcretion. Uh, the most common by far is renal insufficiency, but we also see a number of other areas where we can start to see problems with excretion. These include uh, thiazide diuretics, ethanol abuse, cyclosporin A, pyrazinamide, and also low dose aspirin. While high dose aspirin could actually uh, stimulate, uh, can be a, have a uric effect, the problem is that most patients who have with heart disease are on low dose aspirin, and so that's going to be a big problem. In terms of overproduction, that's a smaller percentage, and there are a number of different disorders we can see. Again, alcohol has an effect on stimulating production, especially beer. Certain genetic uh, diseases can be seen to cause this. Myeloproliferative disorders can do it. Another disease that has been associated with a high uric acid is psoriasis, and that's due to the increased cell turnover. Cytotoxic chemotherapy, when they destroy cells, that increases uric acid. And finally, sickle cell anemia is another one that uh, we can see hyperuricemia. Again, we look at hyper, asymptomatic hyperuricemia. This is a definite precursor to gout. It must be present for the patient to develop gouty arthritis. Uh, it is not the same as gout, and it is not something that necessarily needs to be treated. Uh, in general, a patient who has a serum uric acid greater than 6.8 is felt to be hyperuricemic. Um, again, it's very important to realize just because a patient has a serum uric acid above 6.8 does not mean at this time uh, that they need to be treated. There are studies ongoing as we speak where they are looking at whether uh, patients with gouty arthritis, without gouty arthritis, but with a significant hyperuricemia would benefit uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint from treatment. But um, in the standard of medicine at this time, uh, patients without a history of gouty arthritis but having high uric acid should not be treated for their gout.
As I alluded to on the previous slide, we are starting to see that hyperuricemia is an extremely common finding in patients with metabolic syndrome, with cardiovascular disease, and with diabetes. There are some studies that are starting to evolve in which we are thinking that the presence of, uric, of a high uric acid may have a uh, more active role rather than being coincidental. Uh, Thanasoulis and his group uh, noted that patients who were on allopurinol had a lower mortality rate from congestive heart failure than patients who were not taking allopurinol. Uh, there are also other studies that show that hyperuricemia is an independent risk factor for the development of atherosclerosis in young adults. There are, as I said earlier, uh, ongoing studies looking at whether lowering the serum uric acid might be beneficial uh, in the management of patients with congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. Um, so this is something to be watching for in the future. The next and most common step in uh, gout is the development of the acute gouty flare. Uh, there, the flare is usually um, rather intense. It has an abrupt onset of pain, swelling, and the tenderness is such that uh, many patients will even state uh, that a sheet hurts to touch it. The first attack is usually monoarticular, and the most common site of a first attack is the first MTP joint, uh, giving us the classically described podagra. The attacks usually occur at night. Um, and if you don't treat it, they will subside with time, but it usually takes three to ten days for this to happen. If uh, the uh, joint is aspirated during an attack, your monosodium urate crystals will be present in that fluid. It's important to realize that during an acute gout attack, the serum uric acid levels may actually be normal. And so uh, it's important to keep this in mind because if a patient comes in and under it with an acute attack but has a serum uric acid of say 6.0 this may be um, artificially lowered because of the inflammatory process uh, going on. As the patient continues to have gout attacks they'll occur increasingly frequently and uh, with time uh, without treatment uh, the patient can often develop into um, a chronic polyarticular inflammatory disease that may look just the same as uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory arthropathies. If one looks at the pathophysiology of an acute attack um, we can see uh, a number of different um, events that are actually being looked at and might in the future have an effect on how we uh, address these attacks. First, monosodium urate crystals are de deposited in the synovial space. With time, uh, monocytic cells will start to engulf the crystal and when they start uh, this, a uh, trigger of an inflammatory response, interleukin-1 is released. Um, subsequently, other inflammatory cytokines are released, including interleukin-6, IL-8, uh, tumor necrosis factor, and in a variety of chemokines that help to um, recruit other inflammatory cells into uh, the synovial space. Uh, these chemokines, for instance, help to bring in neutrophils, and with the influx of the neutrophils, we get the classic inflammatory uh, reaction. This is a slide uh, that shows a uh, classic uh, gouty attack in the first MTP, or uh, pedagra. Uh, the ankle on this patient also looks a little bit inflamed uh, when I look at this picture. Uh, the toe is swollen at the MTP joint. It is extremely tender. Uh, the patient will uh, not want you even to touch uh, his foot at this time. Once the attack has quieted down, the patients enter what we call an intercritical period. Uh, while there is no acute active inflammation, crystals can still be present. Uh, if we were to aspirate the uh, uh, quiet joint, quite often we can find uh, both intracellular and extracellular monosodium urate crystals. We can find uh, low levels of inflammation going on.
Studies have demonstrated that even though there is no acute uh, inflammation going on, there is a low level of chronic inflammation. With time, the crystals start to uh, coalesce and we start to see the development of tophaceous deposits. Uh, these tophaceous deposits can cause uh, damage to the joint. With time, because uh, the uh, crystal levels increase, we start to see an increased chance for uh, development of recurrent attacks as well. With time, the patient will uh, progress on to uh, advanced gout. At that time, we're seeing polyarticular flares, we're seeing a persistive, persistent destructive arthritis, and we, be, we start to see uh, clinically apparent tophaceous deposits. Um, these patients uh, may actually uh, have an appearance that looks every bit as destructive and every bit as active as diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. This is a photo of a patient who has a TOFUS that has developed over his olecranon process. Uh, they may or may not be tender. They uh, grow with time and um, if you were to uh, aspirate these, you'd get large amounts of a chalky material, which is uh, consisting of the uh, monosodium urate crystals. This is a photograph of a patient who has uh, chronic tophaceous gout. Some of the highlights uh, in this include the very large uh, collections of the monosodium urate crystals, almost um, having the feel of a golf ball on the top of their uh, hand. If you'll notice in the right second uh, digit, you can see that there has been rather extensive destruction of the bones so that you have a telescoping of uh, some of the phalanges. If you look at the right thumb, you can also see in the thumb tip some white plaques. This is most likely a uh, deposit of the tophaceous material as well and these will often ooze uh, with the chalky material uh, coming out and can be easily expressed. Uh, looking at these under a microscope uh, and you will see the classic um, crystals and we will have some pictures of these uh, later on. This is a radiograph of uh, a uh, interphalangeal joint and you can see uh, an erosion uh, that is classically seen with gout. What you see is a rather sharp margin uh, of uh, the erosion and it sort of has uh, the appearance that there's a, a bite taken out of it. The classic description has been uh, that of a rat bite erosion and uh, these can actually get bigger and bigger. The area uh, where the erosion is is usually filled with uh, a tophus. Uh, the tophi are largely radiolucent. Uh, there may be a little bit of a haziness to it, but generally the, the tophus will not show up on standard uh, radiography. It is somewhat counterintuitive, but the establishment of the gout diagnosis uh, can be a little bit confusing. Now, the attack history is uh, a pretty good way to establish a gout. When the patient comes in and tells me that they've had a sudden onset of foot pain at night, it's in one joint, that it is so tender that the sheet hurts to touch it, it's pretty much likely to be gout. Nevertheless, if there is a history of infection, uh, other inflammatory monoarthropathy or trauma, then I think you have to look uh, and make sure there isn't uh, something else going on. Uh, the gold standard is to perform a joint aspiration and identify both intra and extracellular monosodium urate crystals. Uh, serum uric acid levels can add confusion to the diagnosis. First of all, during an acute attack, um, they may actually drop to normal levels. If you're going to be using the serum uric levels to help you, uh, the most appropriate time to get this is about two weeks after the attack is done uh, during the intracritical period. In terms of treating uh, gout, it is important to separate this disease uh, between the uh, acute gouty flare and the treatment of the chronic hyperuricemia. It should be noted that uh, each of these components require the to be ad require being addressed directly, and that there really is not just one medication that works for both uh, processes. A list here is some of the medications that are used for both gouty flares as well as for chronic hyperuricemia, and we're going to discuss each one of these a little bit more in depth. 
First, let's take a look at the uh, choices for treating acute attacks. And uh, currently, we have several different uh, ways we can go with this, and there are some ongoing studies that are looking at a few new ones, such as interleukin-1 anti-IL-1 agents. Um, but the standards are ones that are available in the uh, clinical practice include non anti-inflammatory drugs, colchicine, and uh, corticosteroids. By far the most commonly used uh, medications for gout attacks at this time are uh, the non anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, this is one area where uh, indomethacin still is used quite frequently, and naproxen has also been FDA approved. Other NSAIDs probably work as well, although uh, these two are um, a couple of the more potent um, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, and they seem to do quite well. Uh, it is important to realize that non anti-inflammatory drugs have significant risks associated with their use. Uh, in 1996, over 16,000 deaths and over 100,000 hospitalizations occurred due to NSAID-induced gastropathy. Uh, similarly, cardiovascular risks such as fluid retention, increase in the blood pressure, uh, renal effects can be seen, CNS effects can occur, and it's important to realize that all of these effects increase their frequency as the patient gets older. If you look at a patient who has uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, GI problems, these are the ones that are unfortunately more likely to have gout attacks. And uh, NSAIDs may not be the best choice if the patient has a lot of problems with these uh, their underlying diseases. Another medication that has been used for uh, literally uh, millennia is colchicine. This is a chemical that is derived from a plant known as the colchicine plant. It is found throughout the Middle East. It, colchicine has been used for years, and the standard mantra for many years has been that a patient takes uh, one colchicine every hour until their attack is under control or until they start to have gastric side effects. Um, fortunately, we have uh, started to do some reassessment of this and a, re a study by uh, Turkeltov and his group in San Diego looked at whether uh, just taking three doses of colchicine in a 24-hour period did as well and what he found is that in patients who were given just three doses of colchicine over a 24-hour period their response was every bit as good as the patients who took it every hour. The most important thing they also found was that the patients who were on the low dose colchicine, that is just three doses in 24 hours, they tolerated the medication significantly better. I uh, very tongue in cheek say that the only patient that I would ever consider giving colchicine every hour on the hour is a patient that I really, really did not like. Unfortunately, colchicine also has its uh, potential side effects, and it is dose-related. It is a medication that has a very low uh, therapeutic to toxic um, window, and so patients who are taking more than 2 to 3 milligrams a day are at a significant increased risk of uh, complications and side effects. Uh, obviously, the gastrointestinal ones, that of diarrhea, abdominal pain, vomiting, are very well known, particularly if you take too much of it. Bone marrow suppression can occur. Uh, rhabdomyolysis and is another problem with it. Uh, it has been shown with chronic use to uh, result in problems with neuropathy, hepatotoxicity, and nephropathy. Finally, it is important to keep uh, in mind that patients on who are taking colchicine chronically can have uh, increased problems if they are also put on clarithromycin. One area that a lot of rheumatologists feel um, might be the least bad choice for treating a gout attack is corticosteroids. Uh, Janssen's in 2008 uh, published a study looking at patients uh, who and comparing the use of prednisolone to naproxen and actually saw that the response was just about equal. When you look at a patient who has uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, renal insufficiency, uh, GI problems, it may be that when trying to find a medication for this patient for their acute attack, a short course of corticosteroids may be the least bad choice you have.
Now we'll switch over to looking at when do we treat an elevated serum uric acid. And I think it's important to look at this um, from the sta standpoint of the patient. Uh, at this time and in this uh, era, the feeling is that uh, we do not treat a patient with benign hyperuricemia. If a patient has established gout where they've had uh, one or two attacks, that is the time to begin serum urate lowering therapy. Um, normally, one of the things we always do is we will use an attack preventing prophylaxis because uh, during induction of the therapy, one can see a uh, an attack of the gout. Anytime you have a rapid increase or rapid decrease in the serum uric acid levels, this can help to trigger a uh, gouty attack. Some of the medications that are used are nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, low doses of colchicine at one or two pills a day, and low dose steroids. Uh, to be very honest, uh, in terms of when a uh, rheumatologist uses get, uh, colchicine, most of us reserve the use of colchicine for uh, attack preventing prophylaxis. When treating a patient with hyperuricemia and established gout, uh, we aim to lower the serum uric acid level below 6.0. Um, first, the timing is uh, rather important. The standard has been that uh, once a patient has had an attack, we try and get them calmed down for at least two to four weeks before we start the urate lowering therapy. Generally, what I will do is at the time of a patient's attack, I will give them something to get their attack under control. I will then start them on a low dose of whatever prophylaxis I'm going to use, have them back in a couple of weeks, at which time I'll check their serum uric acid levels, and then I'll start the appropriate urate lowering th uh, agent. Um, there has been some recent data that looked at uh, starting the urate lowering therapy earlier and they've actually looked at starting it during a uh, time of an acute attack. I'm still a little skeptical of this because of the fact that we've seen too many patients who when started on these medicines it helps to propagate uh, an attack. It is important to realize in a patient who has gouty arthritis, treatment uh, with urate lowering therapy must be lifelong or they will have a recurrence of attacks. Quite often it's asked why in the heck do we shoot for 6.0 when the uh, normal serum uh, urate uh, hyper, uh, solubility maximal is uh, 6.8. Um, there are a couple of different reasons. As I pointed earlier, uh, when you drop the temp body temperature to around 34 degrees centigrade, such as one would see in cold feet, the uh, maximum solubility drops to 6.0. If we want to get the uh, monosodium urate crystals out of the tissues in the feet, in the elbows, colder parts of our body, then we need to get it well below 6. Uh, another reason why it's important to try and get the serum urate lowering, lowered down is uh, based on a study by Soji and his group. And what they saw that in patients who have had an acute attack of gout, if their serum uric acid level is above 9.4, they have an 80 plus percent chance of another attack within a year. Contrast that um, to if they get their serum uric acids down below 6, the chance of another gouty attack drops to about 15 percent. So what we try to do is get the uric acid level as low as we can, as quickly as we can, and this does reduce the uh, chance that the patient has another gouty attack. Now let's take a look at medications that are available to uh, help lower the serum uric acid level. By far the one that is used most commonly in the United States today is allopurinol. This is a medicine that uh, blocks the enzyme hypoxanthine oxidase. It is one that is uh, cleared primarily via renal excretion and this does uh, raise a problem in patients who have renal insufficiency. It does inhibit the production of uric acid. It does not have an effect on uh, uric acid excretion. Its side effects are well known. Uh, we do worry about neuropathy. We do also worry about uh, hepatic disease and mild suppression and blood abnormalities. The one thing that most of us worry about the most is the development of toxic epidermal necrolysis and a dermatitis. Of all the medications uh, that cause this rather rare complication, uh, allopurinol is probably the most common. You need to have, though, uh, adequate renal function um, and you may have to adjust the dose if the um, 
patient is put on this, uh, creatinine clearance of 20 or 30 may cause a problem in using this medication. Another medication that is available, although we are not using as frequently now, is probenicid. This is a uric acuric agent that is that it increases serum uric acid excretion. Uh, for it to work, you need adequate renal function. It starts to really lose its effectiveness in patients who are uh, under excretors uh, when the creatinine clearance drops below 50. If a patient has a history of nephrolithiasis, that is a definite contraindication because the last thing you want to do is uh, help to aggravate uh, a, patient, a patient who already has been shown to cause kidney stones. In a patient who has uh, gouty arthritis and is at maximal doses of allopurinol without effects, probenicid can be used with it and uh, may have a beneficial effect. Uh, again, you want to make sure the patient has adequate renal function and uh, no history of stones. Some of the side effects that can be seen include nephrolithiasis, uh, anemia, rashes, and hepatic damage. We are blessed with the development of a couple of new medicines for the treatment of hyperuricemia. The first one that came on the market is Fibuxostat. Uh, this is another xanthine oxidase inhibitor. It inhibits at a different site in the enzyme than does um, uh, allopurinol. Uh, it is uh, hepatically excreted, so it probably has a, it's felt to have a safer um, side effect profile in patients with renal insufficiency. Normally, what we do is start the patient at 40 milligrams a day, have them come back in about two to four weeks, at which time we look at their serum uric acid level as well as looking at uh, liver um, studies and increase the dose to 80 milligrams if we have not reach and reached the target goal of uh, 6.0 or less. Side effects with this, it can have uh, some uh, adverse effect on liver function and there was some question at first uh, as to whether it increases the risk of cardiovascular uh, disease. Since the more recent studies have demonstrated that allopurinol lowers cardiovascular uh, problems, it is possible that in the studies in which it was compared with allopurinol, it wasn't a factor of increased cardiovascular risk compared to allopurinol as well as, as much as it was allopurinol lowering the cardiovascular risk. Finally, we have a new medication that has only recently been uh, approved, and this is peglotacase. This is a polyethylene glycol conjugated serum uricase. This is a biologic composite agent, and it is administered uh, perennially. This is an incredibly effective agent in lowering the serum uric acid, and it is very good in patients who have failed previous medications. I highlight a phase two trial that was done with peglotacase. They had uh, 41 patients and they found that the most effective dosing was eight milligrams every two weeks. Again, this is given only uh, IV and uh, so you can see giving a patient a dose every two weeks can be rather uh, difficult. Uh, serum urate lower levels were reached below six within six hours of administration. My experience has been that uh, patients who have received this may drop their serum uric acid levels as low as two or even one. It is an incredibly effective agent. One of the biggest problems we've seen uh, is that it rather ha has a rather high uh, side effect um, po possibility. First, about 25% of patients uh, on it chronically can develop infusion reactions and anaphylaxis. There are some recent studies that suggest that um, patients who are at, at a high likelihood of having this reaction uh, see a drop in the effectiveness of the agent. That is, uh, we will do a serum uric acid just prior to administering the agent and if their uric acid has come back up to seven or eight that's a patient where the body seems to be making uh, antibodies uh, against the medicine and those are the patients that seem to be at a uh, rather increased risk of developing an infusion reaction. It also has been shown to exacerbate uh, congestive heart failure so it's not one that I feel is um, used very hastily. We use this as a last resort in patients who really do not have any alternative um, choice.
Now most of my patients are going to come in with gout and they're going to ask what can they do diet wise uh, to help lower the uric acid. Obviously we try to avoid alcoholic beverages especially beer. We talk about cutting back on uh, organ meats and shellfish and they often will tell me there are certain foods that seem to trigger their gout attacks. Trying to get away from the um, fructose uh, the high fructose corn syrup uh, containing beverages such as uh, soft drinks that might help too. There are actually some foods that have been shown to uh, may to possibly help lower serum uric acid levels. Skim milk has been shown to decrease it, uh, but coffee both caffeinated and decaffeinated and finally uh, intake of vitamin C can help. The only problem with these is while they do help and they might provide some benefit, the drops in uh, making major di dietary changes only constitutes maybe at the very most one milligram per deciliter. Monosodium urate is not the only uh, crystal that can be found in uh, synovial fluid. Another one that is uh, seen quite commonly is uh, calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate and this has been associated with a number of diseases, most notably pseudogout. Calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease uh, can actually have a variety of uh, presentations. The classic uh, acute synovitis or pseudogout uh, is well documented, but we can also see a chronic arthropathy such as an atypical osteoarthritis, a variety of different uh, atypical spondyloarthropathies, neuropathies, and uh, what can look like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, radiographically, uh, we see uh, deposition of the crystals within the cartilage, giving us uh, the classic chondrocalcinosis. This is a uh, photomicrograph of the classic uh, calcium pyrophosphate crystals. These are not as uh, strongly birefringent. They also are not as uh, uh, strong uh, in their polarizing lens. While they are um, sort of a needle shape, they are usually a little bit thicker, a little fatter, um, not quite as long. And if you look at the arrows, you can see that these are the py positively birefringent crystals. That is, they are um, blue when they are parallel to the uh, polarizing filters um, orientation, and they're yellow when they're perpendicular, being the exact opposite of the monosodium urate crystals. CPPD has a variety of disease associations. Uh, some of the things we look for include hyperparathyroidism. Uh, it can also be seen in classic osteoarthritis, but it is often seen in patients where ha who have a, a rather atypical, atypical uh, osteoarthritis, such as in uh, patients who have uh, osteoarthritic changes in joints that it's not normally associated. Hemochromatosis is one. Um, we can see hypomagnesemia, hypophosphatasia are also some others in which we ought to look. We look at. Um, in patients with uh, calcium uh, pyrophosphate deposition disease. If a patient is having uh, an acute arthritic attack, uh, first thing we want to try and do is identify and see if there is under any underlying connective tissue disease or uh, other endocrine disorder. Uh, for the attacks, we may use uh, colchicine or non-steroidal medications, as well as local steroid injections for a monoarticular attack. Uh, we have patients who require low doses of colchicine or non-steroidal medicines, uh, sort of as a prophylaxis to help prevent gouty, uh, or the uh, CPP uh, attacks. Finally, one other uh, crystal I wanted to mention is that of cholesterol crystals. This is a uh, rather unique appearing crystal in that it looks sort of like a sheet, sort of like a sheet of mica would, would be what I'd describe it. They usually are somewhat of a parallelogram and they often have a little uh, chip out of the corner. Um, this is one directly from one of my patients. Uh, and these are also very birefringent. 
the one area that this is uh, of importance is that uh, this can be seen in uh, fluid collections of patients who have rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, in fact, I've had two different patients who came to see me uh, with some nonspecific ar arthralgias but had rather large fluid collections. When we found the cholesterol crystals, we actually did some searching and found that they actually did have early rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so this is something to be uh, aware of and keep a watch for uh, in your patients. In conclusion, uh, it's important to realize that gouty arthritis is far more common and more of a serious uh, difficulty within the uh, clinical practice than is, has been normally uh, recognized. It is more common than rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and psoriatic arthritis combined. Patients will generally start off with a monoarticular uh, inflammatory process, but uh, if not uh, adequately treated, uh, may progress to a polyarticular arthritis. In terms of treating this disease, um, we do lower the uric acid and we aim for a uric acid below 6. This helps to lower the development of uh, future attacks. It's also important uh, to uh, impress upon the patient that allopurinol and other urate lowering treatments are not treating the gout attack but by lowering the serum uric acid we will see uh, in the future fewer and fewer gouty attacks. Finally it is important that in a patient with gout uh, urate lowering therapy must be uh, lifelong.